Yes. Good evening. Uh, I am Hari Linigan. I am the Associate Director of the Abbasi for Islamic Studies. Uh, today we are uh, having a very special evening. Uh, and this event is sponsored by the Abbasi Program of Islamic Studies as well as Center for South Asia. And our dear Associate Director is also here with us. Um, today's event is Colonizing Kashmir, State Building on the Indian, Indian Occupation. And uh, it is based on uh, the author's their own book. Um, so this is uh, especially in many different ways because we are uh, hosting a very special guest at a very critical juncture. And it is also very hard not to think about other things going on in the world at this time. Terms like colonization, decolonization, ethnic cleansing, genocide are pronounced a lot these days. And the argument the whole world is focused on Israel Palestine issue. Genocide in Darfur is full backlash against the Masali people, while no one is paying attention. While we are worried about an ethnic cleansing and genocide of the indigenous peoples in Palestine for good reason, Azerbaijan, with the support of the Turkish regime, ethnically cleansed indigenous Armenians from Arsat Nagorno Karabakh from their thousands of years of ancestral homeland. While the bombs killed thousands of in Palestine, the Turkish regime in Turkey had already killed hundreds in northern Syria and left them without electricity and water after occupying Kurdish majority cities of Afri and changing the names of the Kurdish cities, Kurdish towns and streets into Turkish and Arabic. And we can also think about Balochistan in Pakistan, in Iran, Kurdistan in four different countries, and nameless others around the world encountered similar challenges of nation building. And a lot of them are done in the name of integration into the nation state. And interesting enough, these defenders of uh, so-called decolonization in their own language, but also colonization efforts, use very similar language of terrorism. One can find kindred spirits in India's Modi, Turkey's Erdogan, Israel's Netanyahu, and even Iran's Ayatollahs in the appropriation of the language of anti-imperialism and of so this language of decolonization is abused and misused a lot, but today we will have its proper use uh, and proper analysis in a special context. So this book, Colonizing Kashmir, is uh, uh, India, in this book, tells us that the world's largest democracy often repeats that Jammu and Kashmir its own name, Muslim majority state, is an integral part of India, the region which is disputed between India and Pakistan and is considered the world's most militarized zone, has been occupied by India for over 75 years. In her book, Hafsa Kanshwal interrogates how Kashmir was made integral to India through a study of the decade long rule, 1953 to 63, of Bakshi Gulam Mohammed, the second prime minister of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Drawing on a wide array of bureaucratic documents, propaganda materials, memoirs, leader resources, and all interviews in English, Urdu, and Kashmiri, Kanchwal examines the intentions, tensions, and unintended consequences of Bashi states, uh, Bashi's state building policies in the context of India's colonial occupation. She reveals how the Kashmir government tailored its policies to integrate Kashmir's Muslims, while also showing how these policies were marked by Intelligence tension, corruption, and political repression. And challenging the binaries of colonial and post colonial, Kanjwal historicizes India's occupation of Kashmir through processes of emotional integration, development, normalization, and empowerment to highlight the new hierarchies of power and domination that emerged in the aftermath of decolonization. In doing so, she urges us to question tranquilist narratives of India's state formation, as well as sovereignty claims of the modern nation state. And uh, if I may introduce also Hafsa Kanchwal. Hafsa Kanchwal is an assistant professor of South Asian history in the Department of History at Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania, where she teaches courses on the history of modern world, South Asian history, and Islam in the modern world. As a historian of modern Kashmir, she is the author of Historical Colonizing Kashmir, State Building on the Indian Occupation, 
which came out by Stanford University Press and which is also going to be available for your purchase uh, with book signing at the event. And in that, uh, the book examines how the Indian and Kashmir governments utilized state building to entrench uh, India's colonial occupation of Kashmir in the aftermath of partition. Currently, she's working on two book projects. The first is a general history of modern Kashmir. The second examines questions of Muslim political sovereignty and the secular liberal international order in the context of 20th and 21st century. Hafsa has written and spoken on her research for a variety of news outlets, including the Washington Post, Al Jazeera English, and the BBC. She received her PhD in history and women's studies from the University of Michigan and a bachelor's in regional studies of the Muslim world from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Please join me to welcome Hafsa Kanshwa. Suddenly became estranged or alienated. 
I'm interested in a set of inverse questions. How did India acquire Kashmir without the popular consent of its people? How did India and its client regimes normalize its occupation both within Kashmir and also for Indian and international audiences? What were the different modalities of rule that were in operation at this time? And finally, what insights can Kashmir provide us in ongoing theorizations of colonialism, settler colonialism, and occupation? To answer these questions, I look at a decade in Kashmir's recent history, from 1953 to 1963, to understand how Kashmir was made integral to India. In August 1953, Bakshi Gulam Mohammed, who's pictured on the left, led a coup against the state of Jammu and Kashmir's first prime minister, Sheikh Abdullah, to the right. At this time, the entire princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, which had its own rich history of an anti-monarchical uprising, in the late British colonial period, had been divided between the two new nation states of India and Pakistan, following the first India-Pakistan war from 1947 to 1948. The United Nations had called for a plebiscite to take place once hostilities ceased so that Kashmiris could determine their future. Part of the territory, known today as Azad Kashmir and Gilded Baltistan in the green, came under Pakistan, while a substantial part came under Indian control. The region referred to as Jammu and Kashmir, Indian occupied Kashmir, or simply Kashmir. This is where I conducted my research. Right from 1947, India began to colonize the part of Kashmir under its rule. It placed its own client regimes in power and negotiated some level of autonomy, which was enshrined in Article 370 of the Indian Constitution. The article itself was a colonial treaty meant to placate Kashmir's client regimes into thinking that being under Indian rule would provide them with significant autonomy. It allowed the state to have its own constitution, lawmaking body, and the leader of the state was even called a prime minister. Leaders of Indian states were called chief ministers. Residency rights and land ownership and employment were also restricted to Kashmir state subjects. The Indian government was just supposed to be in charge of communications, defense, and foreign affairs. Yet the first prime minister, Sheikh Abdullah, who had initially agreed to Kashmir's accession to India, began to backtrack. He was increasingly concerned with rising Hindu nationalism, as well as the Indian government's attempts to erode the agreed upon autonomy of the Kashmir state. He was removed in a coup by India and replaced by his deputy, Bakshi. Bakshi was in power for a decade from 19. Bakshi was in power for a decade from 1953 to 1963. A shrewd politician, Bakshi had been a ground worker for the Abdullah-led National Conference and was so and so was familiar with local politics. The Indian government tasked Bakshi with promoting Kashmir's contested accession to India domestically and internationally, while repressing popular political aspirations for merger with Pakistan or independence. After violently quashing protests that arose in the aftermath of Sheikh Abdullah's arrest, Bakshi turned his attention to state building and implemented a number of educational and economic policies. During his time in power, the Kashmir Assembly, which was an undemocratic entity that was filled with National Conference loyalists, confirmed Kashmir's accession to India and sought greater financial and administrative integration with the Indian Union, undermining Kashmir's autonomy. Bakshi's period oversaw crucial shifts in India's political and economic relationship with Kashmir towards concrete material integration. Yet Bakshi knew that in order for this relationship and his rule to be legitimized, Kashmiris had to be convinced that this was in their best interest and they had to develop an emotional bond in favor of India. Bakshi was also compelled to respond to the social and economic aspirations of the people especially Kashmiri, Kashmir's Muslim-majority population who had long suffered unjust economic and social policies. So just by way of example, even up until the 1941 census, um, this is before partition, um, under 2% of Kashmiri Muslims were, were educated or were considered literate. What is astounding about his state-building project is that he left no stone unturned in transforming the state and utilized a range of actors from bureaucrats, educators, the cultural intelligentsia, workers, peasants, tourism operators, um, and even Indian filmmakers for this purpose. With financial assistance from the government of India, the Kashmir government established a number of public institutions and developmental projects, 
including schools, colleges, and universities, hospitals, roads, tunnels, irrigation, and power projects, as well as cultural centers, stadiums, and social welfare organizations. So the image that you see here, um, or the two images, are from 1956. It's from the opening of the Bandarab Tunnel, which is called the Jawara Tunnel, named after the first prime, uh, first prime Minister. Um, and so what's significant about this moment is that before this tunnel, um, there was no all-year-round link between the Indian mainland and Kashmir, um, because there were mountains in between. And so um, you would not be able to go for much of the year because of snow. And so this tunnel, when it was built, was a huge feat and was considered one of the longest in Asia at the time. It was built by two German engineers. Um, and it basically went through the mountains and even in the, the speech that Bakshi gives where you see him um, standing there, he says that this will now finally allow for, uh, allow for emotional integration to occur between the people of Kashmir and the people of India. So when I began my PhD research around a decade ago, I found that most of the scholarship primarily focused on the 1947 partition and then the period after the late 1980s when there was an armed rebellion and mass popular uprising in Kashmir against the Indian state. There was very little critical scholarship to help us understand that time period in between, and so therefore I was, I was drawn to it. The dominant narrative about this period, both to a certain extent in popular memory, as well as in the scholarship, is that things were normal during this time, and that it was only because of later Pakistan's interference or India's lack of commitment to democracy, development, or secularism, that Kashmiris became disillusioned, leading to the rebellion and the intense militarization and human rights violations committed by the Indian Army. Now, we may associate development works and efforts at prosperity by the state, like building roads, tunnels, increasing employment opportunities, and enhancing tourism as laudable <coughs> for the people of the region. But I argue that it is precisely through the roots of state building that India colonized Kashmir through client leaders like Bakshi. The decade that Bakshi was in power consolidated the contours of India's colonial occupation by relying on those very same discourses and practices of development, secularism, integration, normalization, and empowerment. And I historicize India's occupation and show that it may have looked different in this time period compared to what happened in the late 1980s with the brutal militarization, but it was still very much involved in suppressing Kashmiri demands for self-determination and sovereignty. So the different chapters in the book look at the ways in which India's colonial occupation operated through Bakshi state building practices, through international diplomacy, film, tourism, education, economic development, and cultural reform. I won't, of course, have time to go into all of the different sections, um, but I will highlight two um, for the remainder of my discussion. Um, but before I do, I also wanted to explain these two photographs. So these were, these were taken in 1956, also 1956, when there was a high profile visit by the Soviet premiers, um, Khrushchev and Bodani, and they were invited by the Indian government and the local Kashmir government to come to Kashmir and see the type of development that was taking place in the state. And so this was a really significant visit um, because it was the first time that such high profile international leaders were visiting Kashmir. And on the photo, um, the photo that you see on the bottom right is Bakshi feeding Khrushchev Kushtaba, which is a Kashmiri youth delicacy. Um, and this was kind of a very iconic image of that moment. And then the one on the left is basically the, the different leaders um, going through crowds in Srinagar um, in, a, in, in their cars. And uh, based on oral interviews that I did with people who were actually in, in, this, in the crowds um, during this time, uh, one of the things that was shared with me is that uh, on that day or the day before, um, people, people from different rural parts of Kashmir were encouraged to come to the city on buses that would be free. Um, they were promised a free lunch as well. Um, and so that's how they were able to get so many people to come out. And they were just told to cheer as this, this car is, is going by. And the Soviet leaders basically saw that excitement or whatever was happening in the crowd as consent for Indian rule. And so after they left Kashmir, uh, they spoke to the media and basically said that it was evident to them that Kashmiris had given their consent to Indian rule. And subsequent to this, um, 
because the issue was still in the United Nations, um, the plebiscite question was still at the UN, um, the Soviet Union was then also able to veto any uh, subsequent resolutions that would come up on Christian. So in many ways, this high profile visit domesticated what was otherwise at this point still an international dispute. Okay, so the first question, or the first theme that I wanna talk about is the politics of life. And I wanted to share a brief anecdote to give you a sense of what this was or how significant this was. In a conversation with an elder in Kashmir during my field work, I was told about a particularly high-ranking Kashmiri bureaucrat who had recently passed away. The relative mentioned that the person had not been very educated. He'd only been metric passed, or basically just passed the 10th grade. But he had been given a clerical job by Bakshi, who had written his job appointment on a matchbox. As oral histories go, there had been many in the 1950s and 1960s who would come across Bakshi in their visits, in his visits to their towns and villages, and he, after asking them if they had a job, would write them an appointment on slips of paper, or more notably, on matchboxes. So to understand the politics of life, it's important to understand how the Indian government and Kashmir's client regime saw the Kashmir issue. In these early years of India's colonial rule over Kashmir, they saw the Kashmir issue not in political terms, meaning not a question of sovereignty or self-determination, but rather in economic terms, linked to a better standard of living. <coughs> Kashmiris were depicted as being malleable, that while they may have had varying political aspirations, they had the potential to be integrated subjects, um, as long as they could experience the benefits of Indian rule. So both governments thought that Kashmir, uh, Kashmiri sentiments could be managed and in many ways fought through state planning. And they attempted to show Kashmiris the many benefits that they could actually incur under India. And so I argue that the early decades of India's colonial occupation were marked by a politics of life. Borrowing the term from the scholar Neff Gordon, who uses it similarly to describe how Israel attempted to create prosperity in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip after the 1967 war. The politics of life refers to how the Indian government and its client regimes propagated development, empowerment, and progress to secure the well-being of Kashmir's population and to normalize the occupation for multiple audiences, including internationally. It entailed foregrounding the day-to-day -day concerns of employment, food, education, and provision of basic services. At the same time, questions of self-determination and Kashmir's political future were being suppressed. This approach to Kashmir was furthered by the Indian leadership, including the first Prime Minister Nehru, as well as Kashmir's client regimes. In a letter to Sheikh Abdullah, which is actually how I start the book, Nehru writes, it must be remembered that the people of the Kashmir Valley and roundabout, though highly gifted in many ways in intelligence, artisanship, etc., are not what we call a virile people. They are soft and addicted to easy living, the common people are primarily interested in a few things, an honest administration, and cheap and adequate food. If they get this, then they are more or less content. Nehru also reportedly once said that India will bind Kashmir in golden chains. And it did. The government intended to ensure that with an improved standard of living and greater prosperity, Kashmiri Muslim sentiment would shift in favor of India. So how are these seeming state building measures in fact, in, in fact instruments of Indian colonization of Kashmir? For that, we can turn to rice. A member of the Kashmir cabinet under Bakshi, D.P. Dar, apparently compounded the theory that, quote, Kashmiris knew little of politics and what they cared about was a hearty meal and they could be won over gastronomically, end quote. Abdullah, who was invested in financial autonomy for Kashmir, had told Kashmiris that they should rather survive on a diet of potatoes before relying on rice subsidies from India. Immediately after his arrest and to quell the protests, Bakshi's government received agricultural subsidies from India, drastically reducing the price of rice. It was estimated that rice subsidies under Abdullah were nearly two million rupees under Bakshi, Total under Bakshi, they reached um, about 6 million, 16 million rupees per year. And the price of rice drastically went down, especially in rural areas. What is really interesting, though, is that Bakshi managed to leverage the threat of political instability and the geopolitical situation of Kashmir to, um, for India's reputation internationally to secure an ongoing and high amount of food aid. For example, between 1956 to 1957, 
officials in the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in India were aghast that the Kashmir government would continue to request such high amounts of rice, even as production of rice was increasing within the state. They were willing to give, the Indian government was willing to give 1,000 tons, but not 36,700 tons that the Kashmir government was requesting. Indian government officials repeatedly requested that the Kashmir government increase the price for local procurement so that there would be a decrease in the demand. But Bakshi protested, stating that the food supply in the state remained careless and that um, the crops had been damaged by floods and hailstorms. He also uh, repeatedly stated that the position of Jammu and Kashmir was materially different from other states. There were other political factors that the government of India should not risk with the state as numerous political implications were involved in the distribution of rice at reduced prices. He basically refused to reduce the price of rice um, and kept requesting more from the government of India. And eventually the Indian Ministry of Home would get involved and write to the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, asking them to take into consideration the special circumstance of the state and then subsequent um, tons of rice that the government was requesting would be deployed. This example highlights how integral the rice subsidization policy in Kashmir was to India's colonial occupation. Subsidization of rice in Kashmir was in sharp contrast to the government of India's overall food policy that relied on terms like scarcity and self-reliance, which suggests the need for the government of India to use a very different development strategy in Kashmir, but also shows how Bakshi was able to leverage political instability in Kashmir to get the best food aid for Kashmir, oftentimes to the sheer dismay of even Indian officials. Bakshi envisioned a political economy in which, Kashmiri, in which Kashmir would receive an ongoing aid from the government of India. As a result, his was a time of plenty. To get the most from, Indian, from the Indian government, all he had to do was refer to the political sensitivities in the state and the compulsions that he was subject to. The provision of aid and abundance under India was intended to remit sentiment towards India and provide legitimacy for his government. If Kashmiris could see for themselves the real, tangible benefits of joining with India, they would be likely to consent to Indian rule. This is fundamentally how the politics of life operated. In subsequent years, the diets of Kashmiris, especially in rural areas, began to change and relied heavily on rice. Rice became associated with the mark of social status, and the flood of rice into Kashmir during Bakshi's time remains one of his lasting legacies. In fact, when my diaspora sensibilities were shocked at seeing some family members having rice, not once, twice, but sometimes even three times a day, I was basically told to take it up with Bakshi. <laughs> <laughs> so what I think is very significant in this is that greater financial integration with India is something that the Kashmir government under Bakshi forced the Indian metropole to concede. Colonial occupation is not always a top-down process but one that can encourage those in the middle, especially those who belong to a comprador or collaborator class, to further and manipulate. This explains in part why it often becomes intractable. Now the reason why the politics of life is important is that when we look at other colonial or settler colonial contexts, the common understanding is that these are places of immense dispossession, violence, war, and marginalization. And of course, many times they are, we're seeing that today. And that has been the predominant story in many ways in Kashmir for decades as well. But then only seeing colonialism as being defined by manifest violence obscures our understandings of the other ways in which it can operate through giving development and empowerment, the banality of everyday life. This is what defined the early decades of Indian rule in Kashmir. As a result of such policies, India was able to position Kashmir as a begging bowl and itself as singularly capable of providing the people their livelihood, entrenching its colonial occupation through fiscal and not direct military means. The second theme that I want to discuss uh, regards secularism and what exactly that secularism entails if India's secular credentials are grounded in the context of a colonial occupation. Indian leaders like Nehru would basically say that India's secular ideals are example, exemplified by its only Muslim majority state, Jammu and Kashmir. You might think then, when it came to representations of Kashmir in the broader discursive domain, Kashmir's Muslim histories or geographies by, might at least be made reference to, especially if they were supposed to have upheld Indian secularism. But this was not the case. 
To say Kashmir was a Muslim majority region that had chosen to join India was largely good PR for international audiences. Domestically and secular nationalist imaginaries of Kashmir, Kashmir was presented as a Hindu space and the heart of Indian civilization from the ancient to present times. How then do we make sense of Indian secularism at this time? My book argues that Indian secularism and Hindu majoritarianism are inextricable to each other. I show how Hindu geographies, imaginaries, and histories, especially through the sole reliance on the 12th century Sanskrit text, the Raja Panjini, Raja Panjini by Kalhana, were central to some, uh, secular discourses. Producing a good Kashmiri secular subject was deployed as a mechanism to criminalize Muslim political aspirations or alternate visions of nationhood. Ultimately, Kashmiri Muslims were politically useful for India's secular politics of inclusion, but this forcible inclusion is aligned with assimilationist settler colonial narratives about Kashmir's history and recent past. As the book shows, the secular was used to both erase and tame Muslim histories of Kashmir. One of the ways in which this comes about is through film and tourism. Film and tourism have served in many ways to territorialize India's colonial occupation and continue to do so. Both sought to produce Indian colonial desires, anxieties, and claims over the occupied territory. Dozens of leading Indian films from this time were made in Kashmir, and Kashmir was often referred to as the top tourist destination of India. It was a place to be seen and experienced, even if just through a cinematic lens. The use of, colonial, the use of tourism, in particular, to enable colonialism is not restricted to Kashmir. So um, on the left-hand side is a 1952 ad from the State of Hawaii Visitors Bureau. Um, and on the right-hand side is also a 1950s ad about Kashmir. And one of the things that I think is really interesting, um, aside from the kind of similarities that they share, is that at this time in the 1950s, we have India, which situated itself as the vanguard of the third world, the leader of the non-aligned movement, um, and then, of course, the U.S., which was at the, the kind of the heart of the Imperial West at the time. Um, but both of them are using similar strategies to depict these places, um, which are kind of at the frontiers of, of the idea of the nation state. Um, and so you have Hawaii and Kashmir, um, and these images kind of show, um, there are others of Kashmir, of course, um, that also feature women um, as well, but just these places of gender desire, but also places that you can go for holiday um, all year <coughs> round. So there's all these activities that you can do in Hawaii all year round, all these activities that you can do in Kashmir all year round. Um, and many of the ads also would talk about how easy it was now to finally get to these places which were otherwise at the fringe of, of the, the nation. Um, so I think it these kind of get, gives you a sense of um, how some of these themes do actually run across um, other, other uh, regions and other colonized territories. And this is uh, an image from 2020, after the Indian government basically pronounced that Kashmir was reopened for tourism after the abrogation, which I'll, I'll get to in a bit. Um, and you can see here that the, the poster says Kashmir Colony. You can also see that this tourist guide from the 1950s also said Kashmir Colony, so Kashmir has been calling now for many decades. Um, and uh, I think, although I'm not 100% sure, it might be a reference to Nehru's own statement about Kashmir, where he uh, describes it as a beautiful woman that was either calling or beckoning to him. Okay. Um, using film and tourism specifically, I argue that representations of Kashmir's history and identity were selective, partial, and distorted ignoring complex historical processes and providing a simplified narrative of Kashmir's natural incorporation into the Indian nation. In their travels, Indian tourists saw and experienced Kashmir in ways that legitimated India's symbolic claims over Kashmir and promoted the naturalization of Indian empire on colonized land. In tourist guidebooks, Kashmir's Muslim histories were either completely erased or relegated, as is what happens across the subcontinent, to stories of invaders. For example, Muslim rulers were often referred to as conquerors, whereas earlier Hindu or Buddhist rulers, despite their varied origins, were seen as indigenous to Kashmir. 
Muslim sacred sites were given a brief mention, while Hindu sacred sites were central to the tourist experience. Few of the Kashmir films even depicted any Muslim, uh, Kashmiri Muslim characters, despite the fact that Muslims were a majority of the region. The ones that did were either simplistic and rustic, like Mamdu in the film Arzu, or Raja, played by Shashi Kapoor, which is on the bottom right, in the film Jab Jab Phool Pille. Raja's character was seen as paradoxically in need of integration to India, or ultimately the authentic Indian subject. It was also during this time when Hindu religious tourism to Kashmir was strengthened. As one guidebook mentioned, Kashmir was a holy land for Hindus. Banaras stands as a molehill before a mountain. Many guidebooks had a special section on the Amarnath pilgrimage, heightening the significance of Kashmir for the Hindu faithful. Why is this significant? Scholars of settler colonial, colonialism have argued that not all states eliminate their subject po uh, populations by killing them off or driving them off the land. The elimination can also occur by assimilation, or what I call integration in the book, where the idea is to rid the people of their own sense of history and identity and bring them into line with the settler colonial state. In this case, India's politics of secular inclusion linked to the erasure or alienness of Muslimness and making Kashmir exclusively a Hindu holy land was intimately tied to processes of settler colonialism. Different aspects of the state building project created their own subversions. Bakshi himself was replaced by the Indian government once he stopped serving their purpose, and this is the fate of many Kashmiris, or many of Kashmir's uh, client politicians up until today. Even though his time and power completely entrenched the legal, political, economic, and social infrastructure of colonial occupation, it did not succeed in emotionally integrating Kashmiris to India. In fact, the decades after his rule led to even greater movements for self-determination. Even if the chains are golden, they will still need to be broken. Now, I wanted to end this overview by bringing this all to the present. On August 5th, 2019, India embarked on the next phase of its settler colonial project in Indian-occupied Kashmir by formally revoking Kashmir's semi-autonomy status. It is not an exaggeration to say that in the past four years, Kashmiris have been effectively silenced as India has changed a series of laws to allow its citizens and armed forces to buy land and settle in Muslim-majority Kashmir in order to change its demographics. These developments are happening under a brutal neoliberal order, which is also making Kashmir a site of global extraction and environmental destruction. In recent years, the Indian government has gone after all forms of potential dissent, from imprisoning the pro-freedom leadership to targeting writers, journalists, artists, academics, human rights defenders, and activists in a variety of ways. Writing or saying anything that portrays the Indian government's actions in a negative light, forget even speaking about freedom or liberation, is a cause for harassment, interrogation, and imprisonment. Much of this also is being replicated in India as political developments under Modi's new nationalist government have led to fears of genocide against Indian Muslims. Examining Indian state formation from the perspective of Kashmir sheds light on what, it, what is otherwise um, considered India's descent into an authoritarian, undemocratic, Hindu majoritarian state. In scholarship and advocacy efforts against Hindu nationalism, there is a tendency to reinforce the idea that India was once secular, once pluralist, once democratic, but has just now been transformed into an ethno-nationalist state. There is no question that the rise of Hindu nationalism has exacerbated India's challenges and that things have gotten categorically worse. Yet, with this increasing nostalgia for an earlier version of India as a result of ramp rampant Hindu nationalism in India today, the inherent violence of that secular liberal order, as well as its entanglements with Hindu majoritarianism, is erased. This nostalgia completely erases how colonialism and domination were at the root of India's state formation, not just in Kashmir, but in other places as well. More importantly, Kashmir and the other regions at the margins or frontiers of the national narrative were not an exception, but remained integral to India's state formation. To put it simply, India's foundational moment cannot be viewed as separate from its colonial occupation of Kashmir. Treating Kashmir as an exception, especially when it was employed to symbolize the Indian nation, while lauding India's otherwise secular or democratic character, is akin to denying settler colonization in the context of US state formation. In some ways, we can see Kashmir and other zones of colonial occupation as a test case for the Indian state to practice various forms of power, 
disciplinary, sovereign, biopolitical, and necropolitical. These strategies would be utilized in the mainland too, especially against populations that are deemed a threat, Muslims, Dalits, and tribal communities, and more recently, anyone who does not align with the internationalist project. Therefore, instead of looking for inspiration in a rather uninspiring past, would it not be better to envision more imaginative and liberatory futures? And finally, even though my book aims to shed light on Kashmir's history, my hope is that this book will be useful for other sites that are like Kashmir. One of my main hopes is that this book will contribute towards a historiography of states that do not exist, have not been allowed to exist, and peoples who have been denied self-determination and the right to exercise their sovereignty. And there are many. Kashmir is not exceptional. A number of other nations and communities have been brought into the fold of nation states without their consent or remain under colonial occupation, apartheid, and war. Modern day borders do not adhere to people's understandings of place and history. And so modern nation states have developed varying modalities of control from the politics of life or to manifest uh, violence to establish their rule in these places where they lack legitimacy. But people have and continue to resist. Great presentation. And uh, now I would like to invite Thomas Van Hansen, who is the also the senior editor of this book, where it came out at Stanford University Press. Um, and he's going to comment uh, on the book. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Should I stand up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for organizing this <coughs> event. I have to say that um, we, um, so I'm the editor of this, uh, along with Dylan Kimlin White, who's sitting here from Stanford University Press. I've had the pleasure of creating and running and developing this series called South Asia in Motion. And uh, one of the objectives we set out was to create and promote work that was different from, that highlighted parts of um, the subcontinent uh, in, in the broader sense um, that had not been covered so much, uh, highlight both problematics and regions and so on and so forth that had been ignored in many ways. And when you work on South Asia, as you all know, there's a big problem called India, right? The elephant in the room. So how does one actually uh, understand South Asia without constantly reproducing common sense understanding of what India properly is. Uh, so we try to reach out and, and, and attract and, and, and encourage work that also looks at other countries in the region and indeed uh, in the periphery of India. We published a number of works in the Northeast. So we were thrilled to receive uh, Hafsa's um, uh, project. And it was like, this is exactly what this book series wants to do, wants to and I think in the presentation you see very clearly that viewing India and viewing South Asia from some of these peripheries affords you a very different view than is possible from Lakhna, right? Or from Delhi, most of Delhi, right? Which is the, the problem of it. So I want to, I want to, don't want to take a whole lot of time. I'm sure many of you have questions. I just want to uh, make a few observations and maybe also ask you uh, to, to uh, reflect on those. There's one thing. I think uh, that's clear is that the language of colonization has only quite recently, and, and you're actually one of the people who really put it forward, but only has uh, more recent, only quite recently arrived in the conversation about Kashmir, right? And, and the, the reasons are, are pretty obvious because we know, for instance, that lots of critical, otherwise critical scholarship, scholarship critical of many things in India, social oppression, structures of, of, of caste oppression, <coughs> and so forth, much of, much of that, even uh, work that's been promoted by Indian historians and social scientists who are critical of, of Hindu majoritarianism, has nonetheless never really questioned Kashmir very much. It's very striking that the majority of the mainstream left in India has since the 1950s, and maybe Mr. Khrushchev has something to do with that, <laughs> wholeheartedly endorsed the idea of the inviolability of India's sovereignty and its borders, right? 
So, so the Kashmir project and the projects of, of incorporation of the Northeast and so on were actually always supported by, by the left, who also bought into the idea that the main, that it's not just, if you say, the politics of life was particularly uh, if, uh, sort of pronounced in Kashmir, but in many ways was also the preferred language of the Indian developmental state in the 50s and 60s and 70s, where it was it wasn't selling itself as a democratic state that gave rights to people. It sold itself as a, as a state that uplifted and developed India and gave India modernity and so on and so forth. A project that the Indian left was also completely engaged and, 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 and behind. Right? So I think, so that's one thing. So the colonization language sort of upends some of this stuff, right? Uh, and I think it also allows us maybe, and I, I want to hear how you think about this in, in view of also of a, another book um, that we published some years ago, Sunil Purushottam's uh, book, From Federation to Republic. This is about the years around and after um, <coughs> the, uh, independence in India, which is often depicted as a peaceful time of the peaceful transfer of power. But actually, he shows it's a very violent time where. Uh, not only uh, is there violence in Kashmir, but also the violent incorporation of several uh, states and territories, including Hyderabad, but also parts of Northeast and, and so on, and establishing permanent military presence of some of the areas. And, and I think it, it, so your story in some ways invites perhaps a further reflection on that so-called incorporation of the prince, uh, princely states, and you know, Kashmir was one of the princely states in that uh, larger system that the late colonial state had established. That maybe leads us to think of the language of colonization through infrastructural development and other forms of, of uh, and the politics of life and development and, and lots of other stuff uh, with what has happened in the Northeast, for instance. Uh, 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 and I, so I think there's a lot of that, but I want to hear your thoughts of where you think that the limits of that language, whether that's also applicable, in which way, I mean, people from Nagaland would say, yes, indeed, because we actually declared our independence before India, right, which is technically true. Um, so, so that's one issue. Um, I mean, well, how does this, when you look at drilling down in, in this, particular story of sort of benign as it were developmental incorporation, what does it uh, tell us about some of these other areas and in what way does it actually allow perhaps a re-evaluation of some of these early years of the 1950s um, and, and how we look at these the erstwhile uh, princely states. Uh, so, uh, so that's one option. The other one is maybe a question of Sometimes people, and you also mentioned it yourself, use the term settler colonialism, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's a, maybe a difficult term to use yeah, in, in a precise way, right? Because um, there was actually no settling, uh, and Kashmir was like many of the formerly tribal areas that had been delineated by the colonial state, which actually came via these uh, uh, various provisions in the Indian Constitution, right? defined and protected from colonization by mainland or people from the rest of the country who couldn't go and settle there by these rather strict domicile laws that have now been repealed. And again, we see that they've been repealed in Kashmir or softened in Kashmir, but also softened in other places that, are, that have uh, been until now protected by the sixth schedule of the constitution, which, which stipulates who can actually move there, who can how long can you, can you uh, live there, who, who can buy land, and so on and so forth. So it seems to me that what we see now is part of a, it, there is a Kashmir is, is a window into a much larger transformation that is kind of opening up a, in, in, the, in the name of a certain kind of uniformity of the country, but a, an opening up of lots of other areas for a form of colonization that's happening. Happens now, so it's a set of colonialism that only begins to settle now under uh, under a Hindu nationalist government. So, but thank you very much for writing this book, and uh, thanks for coming and talking about it. So, please.
the, yeah, and thank you so much sure, uh, sure, for the hands and for yeah, each discussion. Are you sure you want to stand here? Yeah, I, I can sit there. Yeah. Yeah. We have to put the moderator also. Yeah. <laughs> So, so yeah, I think um, this the term colonization, well, part of what I'm arguing in the book is that uh, when I was trying to observe what was happening in Kashmir, um, it was very, especially in the period that I'm looking at, um, I actually use settler colonialism, colonialism and occupation, which sometimes get theorized kind of in separation from each other, that these are like distinct uh, theoretical like ways or mechanisms in which um, these forms of domination occur. Um, but I saw elements of colonialism, elements of settler colonialism, and elements of occupation um, taking place in this context. So I, I think that's kind of one, one main thing in terms of what's happening in Kashmir in terms of how I understand it. Um, but I do think that uh, there are definitely some uh, overlaps and comparisons to be made, um, especially in the Northeast, where, as you mentioned, there was this self-determination movement that was quashed by Nehru, India's first prime minister, um, and uh, more kind of sovereign methods of rule, like ASPA, uh, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, were actually used in the Northeast before they were even used in Kashmir, which was in the 90s is when they were uh, deployed in Kashmir, and I think it was in the 60s when it was used in Assam. Um, so, so I think for sure this will open up uh, ways in which to think about other parts of India or broadly the sub subcontinent in different ways. Um, but I do want to kind of have two distinctions. One is that Kashmir, I'm looking at Kashmir as a place that kind of foundationally there was a contested legitimacy of the state there. Um, and in other places, uh, you could perhaps argue that it, that kind of fundamental contestation didn't occur or it wasn't at least internationalized in the way that Kashmir was with the UN resolutions, which I think also in many ways uh, shape how Kashmir was dealt with both by the Indian state um, as well as the international community. Um, but you know, there are always these other parts, um, places like Jharkhand or Chhattisgarh, which where you see that legitimacy evolving or being undermined uh, given the Indian state's actions in those regions. So is there a way that we can think about um, like a colony, which is what I'm arguing Kashmir is, versus these other territories that then kind of, um, where the state starts enacting its colonialism and that's also how it subsequently loses its legitimacy. Or, because I, I think, I don't necessarily want to collapse the two um, in terms of that distinction. Um, but I think the, the Northeast does offer a really important comparative to Kashmir. Um, second question about settler colonialism. So I was, you know, just um, in terms of how I view settler colonialism, why I thought that there were elements of settler colonialism that were occurring even in the 1950s. Um, one is to think about settler colonialism So yes, the actual Indian settlers did not come in, but the kind of narratives about Kashmir's history and past, um, in many ways, in terms of how this you know was depicted as Hindu land, and that the indigenous people were exclusively Hindus, and that the Muslims were foreigners and invaders. I think those kinds of narratives, um, you know, are do form one part of how settler colonialism operates as a structure. Um, which is then what, of course, allows the Indian state under a more Hindu nationalist government to then say, well, you have been saying that this is Hindu land all along and that this was integral to our Indian civilization. Um, and so why can't people from Bihar or UP or so on settle here? Um, and then that's what then makes it more of an, of an event, which is what I think in many ways um, August 2019 was. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much. Now we could yeah, start taking questions from the audience. Uh, please introduce yourself as well uh, when you are asking questions. Thank you for your great uh, talk for introducing us to your, your work. Um, I'm Matt Perkins, I'm the curator for South Asian Studies and Library here at Stanford. Um, just kind of picking up on the last thing, so, so uh, colonization is not a metaphor in, in a sense if I'm understanding correctly, what you're saying is that settler colonialism was a metaphor, which set the stage for it not being a metaphor anymore in like 2018. Mm, no, I, wouldn't, I still wouldn't say it's a metaphor, because I think developing those narratives are like 
like the ideology of what would then allow like an actual settler population to come in is, is still not metaphorical, right? It has actual implications for how the, the land and the space is being used or they're visualized. Um, so, so no, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a metaphor, but I think that there are elements of settler colonialism that do apply here, even though that might not be like the most foregrounded um, like way to think about it because it's also overlapping with colonization as well as occupation. So the colonization, or you can say it was colonized by the Indian collective fantasy of the country, right? Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Um, I'm Natal Sharma, a PhD student at Purple Time. Um, thank you so much for your book. Um, yes, uh, so the question I have is, kind of picking up on this conversation, there's this book by Kelly Hernandez called The City of the Moon. Um, and I feel like what you're doing here is really great because you're extending the kind of concept of settler colonialism by in introducing this like like the pre pre stage of settling and what is required in advance for settling. And in her book, she kind of goes through like um, the the development like it, she studied LA and the Tongva like indigenous people who are living there prior to the um, kind of like uh, Spanish colonizers who are from the lower caste in Spain and who are like kind of fed a narrative of you know manifest destiny and freedom and you know they so they have like there is this kind of like um, space to draw comparisons to the narrative building pre um, the actual settling. Uh, and so I feel like you can really, you can like situate yourself pretty strongly with the settler colonialism um, logics. Uh, sorry, I was just like very excited about what that. What's the name of the book again? Um, City of Inmates. Yeah, and, and I think that the kind of question I had was just like, you know, um, what do you think like based on your studies is it, is it just that there's like a Hindu nationalist state now, and so that, that's why there's the push for settlement within the region? Um, or like, what, what do you think is the kind of like, is provoking uh, actual like, uh, incentivizing people to go and settle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, I, you know, there are, it's <coughs> interesting, there are moments from 1947, where Kashmiris were worried about demographic change, um, the possibility of demographic change. And so that's also why early client regimes like Sheikh Abdullah's um, wanted to situate or uh, have Article 370 because of that fear of demographic change. Um, but that demographic change actually had already occurred in the region of Jammu. Not a lot of people know that in Jammu, um, at the time of partition, there was a large scale massacre by the Maharaja Hari Singh, the last over ruler of Kashmir, where about 250,000 Muslims were killed in Jammu. Jammu used to be a Muslim majority region, um, and 250,000 more were exiled into what now is the new Pakistan state. And so the demographics of the Jammu region completely transformed. And that was actually the fear that a lot of Kashmiri Muslims had is that what happened in Jammu is going to also happen in the valley, which is why at the very least, our client politicians need to put out some kind of apparatus to, to protect, the, to protect uh, Kashmir from that happening. Um, but in 2008, there was actually um, a summer of protests, and the reason for that protest was, and many people died during those protests, was actually because the state was trying to take land, um, like canals, huge canals of land that they were going to give to a shrine board uh, to run the Amarnath pilgrimage. And so Kashmiris came out in massive protests, like 500,000 people came to the streets because they knew that this was a way now to then facilitate that, that process of grabbing land, giving it to the state or to the army and so on and so forth. And so they eventually, the government at that time, which was under Congress, or like a, not a BJP international government, but they had to kind of roll, roll back that plan. Um, so I think that threat of demographic change, the threat of land being taken, and mind you, land actually to go back to the settler colonial analytics, the Indian Army has grabbed land. You know, the army itself is a, is a settler. Like, like there's almost 
a million, yeah. almost a million soldiers in the infantry. And so they grab huge tracts of land for their cantonments, their bunkers, etc. Um, and so that land grab process had been happening for a long time as well. Um, but I think what makes it happen under new nationalism is that um, or under Modi is that this was part of the platform to really rally up the Indian masses. Um, the Bad Masjid was one, um, and this was the, the second kind of main uh, thing, issue that Modi ran on for his uh, the second election um, was the revocation of Article 370. Um, and because he was kind of playing to a crowd that, that had been wanting this for a really long time and had felt that uh, Congress had been making too many overtures or appeasing Muslims in Kashmir too much, and they needed to now end that. So. Hi, uh, I'm Park. I teach South Asian history here at Stanford. First of all, congratulations for the book. I'm really looking forward to reading it. It's very exciting. Uh, I'm just going to repeat a, a part of Thomas's question when he spoke about the historiography of princely states' this acquisition. And um, I was wondering if So I think in that way then, you know, when we think about other princely states, like did they offer up that kind of conundrum in terms of whether their incorporation into the now Indian states is, um, is contested or whatnot? Many of them I don't necessarily think that they did. Um, so I think there would be a limit to completely applying it to all of the, the princely states, unless very similar strategies and policies by the Indian state was used in them as it was used so Hyderabad, I think, may offer an interesting uh, comparison, but I'm not sure if I would want to like include all of uh, the princely states in this in this formation. The second question about the um, the princely Dogra princely states and the mechanism, or you know, the overlaps in terms of the bureaucracy. So of course, the structures of the bureaucracy largely stayed the same. Like there was, you know, the same kinds of offices which you saw across the board, um, but the Client regimes in Kashmir were doing something fundamentally than the Dogras because they recognized that the majority of the population was Muslim. They had um, suffered economically, educationally. I shared some of the statistics with you earlier under the Dogras. And so they really wanted to empower Kashmiri Muslims in particular. Um, and part of what that do does is upset the people, the Kashmiri Hindu population, the Kashmiri Pandits, who were a minority at the time. But under the Dogras, they had faced you know, they had actually been granted positions and um, 
you know, disproportionately to the actual percentage of the population. And so they felt now that they were being um, sidelined because so much of the state's efforts were on Michigan Muslims. So I think in terms of like actual development plans, state plans, um, like what the client regimes was, were doing was very different from the global state. Although administratively, of course, there were there were overlaps. Hello, uh, my name is Riley from a uh, second year law student. And I'm interested in, inside of the colonial framework that you set up, uh, did, and with part of Kashmir being in Pakistan, I'm, I'm interested in what type of strategies India might have employed to create a differentiation between them on that borderline of being like, oh, the, this side of Kashmir is distinctly different than the side that Pakistan controls. Yeah, that's a great question, because one of the things that India uses, um, and there's a lot of like propaganda materials that it's putting out, both for Kashmiris, Indian citizens, as well as the international community. Um, and so these were like reports that were sent to different embassies around the world, um, was to compare how development work in Pakistan was, uh, under the reports that were controlled by Pakistan, was fundamentally different. Um, and that there was not much development happening, which is actually, it, it, it was true. Um, because in some ways, I think the Pakistan state didn't necessarily feel compelled to do that as the Indian state did because it had a lot more confidence in its ability to kind of hold on to that territory. But, um, but so India would use like, you know, there's no development happening in Kashmir, uh, in, on the Pakistan side, but look at what we're doing in our side. We're building all these schools, we're putting in all of this money to build infrastructure, um, and that is not happening on the other side. So development in many ways in the politics of life does actually come into play. Um, thanks so much for this really kind of exciting introduction to a book that I'm looking forward to reading. Uh, I just taught Heather today in my class and we were discussing the role of women in this conversation and because you're thinking in terms of secular colonialism, I'm really curious to hear um, from, there has been discussion, Ananya Jana Kabir has written about films like Kashmir Ki Kali, uh, but then we also have post 2019 and the abrogation of three, uh, 370, these tweets from Hindutva, you know, guys talking about now we can all go to Kashmir to marry light-skinned women, right? So the, the part of this occupation colonialism language is being played out in very gendered terms. So from Nehru saying they are not a very variety of people to the production of the Kashmiri man as the terrorist, the Muslim terrorist, um, to this kind of post abrogation of 370 kind of being seen as an emasculation of the Kashmiri man and the woman being available. We know from Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang as well, how settler colonialism, how white uh, Americans, for example, will want to claim an Indian grandmother, a Native American grandmother, but not a grandfather. So the feminization of the land as available for occupation, there's a whole range of gender discourses. And considering this decade that you're looking at, I'm wondering at the level of policy, is there a kind of gendering around politics of life? Who is cooking the rice? Who is getting the ration card, right? These are highly gendered questions. And so given this range of media representations, the contemporary discourse, there just seems to be something around the figure of the Kashmiri woman as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, so I think this came out the most in uh, my discussion of tourism and film, and that's where like these imaginaries are being created. Um, I would, I, I mean, what's also, so there's a couple of things, this is like a very complicated question, but I'm so glad that you asked it. Um, this didn't end up being in the book, but one of the things that I looked at is how the state government in many ways deployed feminism. So as with all of these other, um, you know, things that we assume have positive balances, like secularism, like dem democracy, feminism was also used in a really interesting way because the state was intending to ensure now that Kashmiri women, and Muslim women in particular, would be given their rights as well. Um, and so opened up a number of educational institutions, tried to hire them, send them off abroad to study and so on and so forth. Um, but what's interesting is that part of what this led to is um, these uh, feminist projects of state building were then affiliated with the state, which didn't have legitimacy. And so it made it very difficult for um, women's mass movements or feminist movements like kind of on the ground to emerge because feminism itself was associated with the state, which many saw as a, like an occupying force. Um, but what's 
also interesting in that in oral interviews that I conducted from the 1950s and 1960s, um, women would tell me, um, women who were at the women's college, for example, at that time, um, they of course faced like ease of access, mobility, the fact that they were not going to school, um, getting some higher degrees, etc. Uh, but they would say that their political aspirations were always clamped down on in these institutional spaces. So you could not, I mean, one of the, the uh, people that I interviewed said you could not even utter the word Pakistan, or like, and this is in the 1950s and 60s, or show any kind of appreciation for Pakistan. Um, all of that kind of came to the fore uh, a bit after my period in the 1970s when um, there was an attempt by the government to change the name of the women's college to the Nehru Women's College, and uh, uh, girls, like young girls from the college at that time actually protested. They were like, we absolutely do not want this name change. So it's really interesting then how feminism in some ways got, was co-opted by the state, um, and so that was one gender angle. But um, I think in terms of film and tourism, we certainly saw um, these depictions of Kashmiri women or photos of them, they show them as being fair, um, as having Aryan light skin features, blue eyes, and so those narratives about Kashmiri women have existed from, from a much longer time period than, and of course, again, it becomes so much more heightened under Hindu nationalism, where you have those kinds of sentiments being expressed in terms of marrying the fair Kashmiri bride. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to read your book. Um, and I've actually gone through a few portions and I was wondering, uh, you might have talked about this in the book already, but uh, there's a place where you talk about um, Kash Kashmir, the, the state of Jammu and Kashmir being really three regions. Um, and you say that the post-1947 government, um, the goals of the government was were to unify a state identity and to find coherence among the different regions. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit more to that. But specifically, I was wondering sort of the existence of these two regions, Jammu. You spoke a little bit about Jammu right now, but also Ladakh. And they are kind of demographically a little bit different. They have very different histories up to a certain point. And so I was wondering if, on one hand, um, sort of the incorporation of these regions, if they if they so even you know, dilute the Kashmiri claim to autonomy, <laughs> What's happening? What? How are these uh, regions featuring in the the history of colonization in uh, Kashmir during the period that you address, and how sort of is state building or nation building? Um, what are these? How do these agendas um, deal with the existence of Jammu and Ladakh and sort of their own um, sort of demands for um, separation? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So. Um, so I, I guess I could speak about Jammu a little bit separately, only because it did have that Muslim majority, right? So then that was transformed, um, and the Hindus were demographically higher in Jammu. Um, all of these regions kind of offer different complexities to the Kashmir government under Bakshi, and of course other client regimes. Um, but the state building angle was really only reinforced, I, I would say, argue in the Kashmir Valley, to the extent that in subsequent decades, uh, people in Jammu, people in Ladakh would complain that they didn't get the development that was needed, um, you know, or that was given to the valley. There was so much attention that was being played on the valley, uh, placed on the valley instead of Jammu or Ladakh, and so there were complaints about that. And so I think it is primarily because the state felt that it had the least legitimacy in the valley where development was emphasized much more there. Um, but with um, with Jammu and Ladakh, in terms of, sorry, I'm just trying to think of, so there was a question about state building. Um, oh, but in Jammu, at this point, there was actually the rise of Hindu nationalism or Hindu nationalist groups um, from India that were in many ways in touch with groups in Jammu um, that were upset that the Kashmir government was appeasing Kashmir <coughs> Muslim. And so that's also when you had um, you know, calls for uh, the removal of Article 370 to happen much earlier than so this was in the 50s and 60s where different groups in Jammu were saying like why does Kashmir even have this special status? We should just be fully integrated into India. Um, and so after 2019 occurs, there are these um, like celebrations in Jammu and even to a certain extent in Ladakh as well um, that okay now we're finally with India, but then very soon they realize that that means that they're 
job opportunities and the opportunities that they were able to enjoy because of Kashmir's special status are now being taken away. And so then there were protests against what's happening. So it's a bit, um, you know, it's a bit complicated and kind of confusing, but uh, for sure the state saw these regions differently um, and not necessarily, despite trying to unify them as well. Thank you. Uh, there's one more. Yeah, uh, Hi, thank you. Uh, so my question is basically around the identity, uh, because I mean the homogeneous identity has its own problem, and given it, the complex history of India and its diversity, uh, so how do you kind of you know, respond to the uh, you know collective identity being a Muslim or there are you know, a lot of differences regionally, linguistically, culturally. Uh, so and uh, so I want you to kind of you know talk about the differences and uh, association with uh, Kashmiri Muslim and other Muslims, other parts of India, India, uh, Indian Muslims. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, so in terms of identity. So that, that's one. In terms of uh, Indian Muslims and Kashmiri Muslims, um, I guess from the perspective of Kashmiri Muslims, what people would say is that, uh, you know, given that Indian Muslims were kind of called to prove their loyalty to the Indian nation state, um, amongst the Indian Muslim leadership or um, people, like, you know, heads of organizations and so on, did not necessarily express their solidarity with the Kashmir issue for them that they would, their own loyalties to the Indian nation would be uh, questioned and challenged. Um, and so I, part of what Kashmiri Muslims will argue is that of course the Indian Muslim question um, has been a different one than the Kashmiri Muslim question. So, but now I think what's happening is that in many ways those, they're fundamentally tied, right? Because it's a, it's a very different dynamic that, um, that's being dealt with now. Um, but yeah, one being that this is like how can Indian Muslims get rights and recognition as, as minorities within the state, but we are a colonized population, so it's a very different political aspiration. I don't know if you were following the protests some years ago in um, JMU where, um, you know, Kashmiris use Azadi to say freedom, and they mean from the Indian state, whereas Azadi is used within India to just talk about freedom within. And so this outside and within framework, I think, in some ways encaps encapsulates the Thank you so much. Uh, so it's about time. And we are very fortunate, we have been very fortunate to have both the author and the editor with us and also this great audience with great questions. Uh, thank you so much for making this a great event. And uh, please join me to thank uh, Professor Kanshwal and, and Hamdi.